So I start off with a warning, the traditional disclaimer um, that I don't use, but I, I should caution people. There are pictures of uh, Keynes in this presentation, so if anybody gets a little bit squeamish when they see him, we'll try and do this. Now, it's interesting. I, whenever I do these things, normally the stuff I talk about is a little bit out on the wide, but today you know, a couple of things that I'm going to mention have been uh, touched upon briefly, so hopefully we can tie the whole thing together. Let's see if this will work for me. Any sound, guys? No sound? Careful, because it's going to be really loud now. OK. Well, what you would have heard, had the sound been working, was the theme tune to Faulty Towers, which, uh, as many of you know, I'm told it was very popular here in, uh, in Norway. It was a very popular... Uh, British sitcom, and there was one episode entitled The Germans when uh, a heavily concussed Basil Fawlty, that's not him, that's me. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not quite sure what's happened here. Should we start again? <laughs> here we go. Uh, a heavily concussed Basil Fawlty insisted on giving the same advice. <laughs> here we go. Magic. Thank you very much. It's almost like I can tell the future, isn't it? <laughs> so that was the theme tune to Faulty Towers, as we've already discussed. And uh, the episode I was talking about, called The Germans, uh, Basil Faulty, heavily concussed, keeps giving the same advice over and over to his staff. Don't mention the war. And this is uh, advice that he himself fails to follow to spectacular effect. Uh, and I'm like Basil, I'm going to ignore that, and I'm going to talk about a few wars. Um, some of them past, some of them potentially future. And I'm going to begin, as I tend to do these things, by going back uh, a couple of hundred years. Now, the 19th century was a time of great upheaval uh, right across the world. There were no fewer than 321 major conflicts uh, in that single century, a uh, century which uh, encompassed the Napoleonic Wars, the Boxer Rebellion, U.S. Civil War, um, the Spanish-American War, the Opium Wars, and the Boer War. That single century saw no fewer than 52 major conflicts in Europe alone. Britain, as the world's preeminent superpower of the time, was involved in an astounding 73 conflicts in that single 100-year span. France, they fought in 50 wars, and Spain contested 44. How crazy was Europe in the 19th century? Well, Britain and France uh, fought on the same side in six major conflicts. The Spanish and the French sided together on nine separate occasions, and Britain and the Spaniards found themselves in alliance in seven different wars. However, Britain and France fought no less than eight separate wars between 1803 and 1815. The French and the Spanish battled each other on four separate occasions, and the Spaniards and the British were at each other's throats six times. And people wonder why the EU is such a tricky proposition. <laughs> the serious point, though, uh, is that once it comes to war, former alliances count for nothing. Anyway, as the 19th century made way for the 20th, uh, Jan Bloch, a Polish banker, wrote a book entitled Is War Now Impossible?, which was inspired by the crushing defeat of the French army by the Prussian-German alliance in 1870. Now, in it, he predicted that the lightning wars of the past, where cavalry ranks and infantry men fought hand-to-hand -hand uh, combat and decided victory and defeat in short and very brutal fashion, were to be replaced by drawn-out, grinding trench warfare. It's a cheerful read, if you ever want to read it. It's, uh, it's great fun. But despite these dire predictions, the first decade of the 20th century was blissfully peaceful. There were no conflicts anywhere on the European continent between European powers. But by the time 1910 rolled around, political tensions were rising across Europe, uh, the Franco-Prussian War, which had so inspired Bloch, had led to the creation of a German empire. The ascension of Wilhelm II to the throne in place of arch-diplomat uh, Otto von Bismarck had led to Germany becoming more bellicose. Russia had lost most of its Baltic and Pacific fleets in the Russo-Japanese War of 1905, and that had led to a revolution. And that defeat in the Far East for the Russians forced the country to turn its attentions westward towards the Balkans, a place which it eyed very greedily along with its old rivals, Austria-Hungary. Meanwhile, in 1907, Britain and France uh, had signed the Entente Cordiale, which finally put to bed 1,000 years of basically continuous conflict between the English and the French. Or when I say put an end to it, it basically reduced the warfare between the two to bouts of French impoliteness countered by bouts of tutting by the British. In 1908, uh, Austria-Hungary had annexed uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina, and in 1912, Serbia, Greece, Montenegro, 
and Bulgaria formed the Balkan League to challenge the Ottoman Empire. Now, after some classic infighting, when Bulgaria turned on its allies, only to be defeated within a month, the Balkan League emerged victorious. And this was a problem. This victory disturbed Austria-Hungary, who feared nothing more than a strong Serbia on its southern border. So here's where Europe stood in 1914. Great Britain, her power receding, was struggling to play the role of the world's policeman. Newly industrialised and ruled by a very nationalistic ruler, Germany was puffing out its chest to the rest of the continent. And good old France was in steady decline, still. And no doubt painfully reliant upon her old foe, uh, Great Britain, for support. And yet, with uh, geopolitical turmoil everywhere, the man in the street was remarkably sanguine about the state of the world. The projects and politics of militarism and imperialism, of racial and cultural rivalries, of monopolies, restrictions and exclusion, which were to play serpent to this paradise, were little more than the amusements of his daily newspaper. Now, those words were written by none other than everybody's favourite economist, John Maynard Keynes, in his book, The Economic Consequences of the Peace, a publication which made him a household name right around the world. And it's a sad indictment on today's society that in order for a modern-day economist to achieve Keynes's level of peace, he'd basically have to become a serial killer or marry a Kardashian. <laughs> but if we go back to Europe in 1914, and despite the numerous mounting problems, as Keynes had pointed out, everyday life went on as normal. And the men and women of Europe in general, and the UK in particular, assumed that nothing untoward would happen. The politicians would just find a way of getting it all sorted out. And then on the 28th of June, 1914, amidst all these known knowns, a young man called Gavrilo Princip stepped up to a passing car in Sarajevo and with a single shot became a black swan that changed the course of history. Now, we don't have time to go into uh, World War I at this point in the narrative. Uh, anyway, I'm told there have been a few books written on the subject. Uh, but suffice to say, Bloch's sombre prediction of grinding drawn-out trench warfare turned out to be uncannily accurate. Now, after four years of war that tore the world apart, like never before, uh, a peace was finally reached. But it was a peace about which one man in particular uh, was somewhat vociferous in his condemnation. OK, calm down, people. Calm down. Anyone that's nervous about Keynes, let's just sort that out for you. That normally <laughs> calms people down a bit. Now, Keynes had left Cambridge University to work at the Treasury in 1915, and he'd been handpicked to attend the Versailles Conference uh, as an advisor to the British government. He was staunchly against reparations of any kind and advocated the total forgiveness of all war debts. Go figure. But in the event, his advice to focus on an economic recovery was completely disregarded, and Keynes resigned in fury, returned to Cambridge, and went and sat in his garden, scribbling furiously in his notebooks. And in just two months, Keynes wrote the book that would make him a household name around the world, The Economic Consequences of the Peace. And in that book, he was highly critical of the peace that was struck at Versailles, uh, and he said it would, he was sure it would lead to further conflict in Europe. He described it as a Carthaginian peace. The three major figures on the Allied side of the negotiating table at Versailles were President Woodrow Wilson of the USA, President Georges Clemenceau of France, and Britain's Prime Minister David Lloyd George. Wilson wanted what he called a fair and lasting peace, which was based upon his famous 14 points plan, and would create a League of Nations, which was the forerunner to the UN, and reduce the armed forces of all countries. The French, well, they were just pissed, understandably. They wanted Germany to be punished, and they proposed severe reparations alongside punitive confiscation of land, arms, industry, and even people. Lloyd George was caught between a rock and a hard place. Privately, he agreed with everything that Wilson proposed, but public opinion in Britain dictated that he side with Clemenceau. Now, on the other side of that table, obviously, was Germany. And in truth, if you base it purely on the numbers, Keynes's uh, claims about the nature of this peace are very hard to dispute. Germany was forced to pay 6.6 .6 billion pounds in, uh, in reparations. And to put that into perspective, that's about 320 billion pounds in today's money, or half a trillion dollars. Now, if you want a little bit more perspective, the amount of money that Germany was forced to pay back after World War I, an amount so severe that it led, as we'll see shortly, directly to World War II, was conjured up out of thin air by the Bank of England, inflation adjusted, I ought to stress, in just 33 months between January 2007 and September 2009. But there's more. Along with those reparations, Germany lost 13% of its land, 12% of its population, 48% of its iron ore production, 15% of its agricultural land, and 10% of its coal, which was given directly to the French. Along with that, the German army was cut to 100,000 men, the navy to 36 ships and no submarines, and it was forbidden from ever having an air force again. The peace hammered out of Versailles would end up having grave consequences just 20 years later, as the economic straitjacket into which Germany had been buckled enabled a firebrand former colonel in a uh, corporal in the Bavarian army to seize control of the country and once more plunge the world into the darkness of war. Now, alongside warfare, 
there are few things that affect a greater proportion of a nation's citizens than economics. And as hard as it is to believe, given today's apathy towards the subject, before the advent of cable TV, the study of economics was the stuff of rock stars. Until Sismondi's Nouveau Principe d'Economie Politique was published in 1819, classical economists had either denied the existence of the business cycle or blamed them on external factors, chiefly amongst them, funnily enough, being war. In 1860, the French economist Clément Juglar had identified repeating economic cycles, which lasted uh, 7 to 11 years, and Joseph Schumpeter had expanded upon Juglar's work by identifying four separate stages within the Juglar cycle, expansion, crisis, recession, and recovery. Now, these four stages uh, form what is understood in the modern world to be what we used to lovingly refer to as the business cycle. And I say used to because half of the business cycle has been abolished by the Federal Reserve for reasons that we'll come to shortly. However, in 1920, just one year after the Treaty of Versailles was signed, a Russian economist called Nikolai Kondratiev founded something he named the Institute of Conjuncture, not conjecture, conjuncture, at which he and a team of fellow economists studied conjuncture or business cycles. Uh, and this was with a particular focus on the long waves that they identified within those cycles. Now, over the years, there's been a tremendous amount of debate as to the usefulness of such long-term prognostications, but there's one very good reason why I, and many others, I think, believe that there's significant advantage to be gained through the study of long wave cycles, and it's this, which I have to say is plenty good enough for me. <laughs> now, Kondratiev, being a Russian, of course, took the long view. He took Schumpeter's four stages and equated them to the four seasons in a calendar year. Once he'd identified what, uh, what he felt to be the correct length of each spring, summer, autumn, and winter, Kondratiev had his wave. And as it turned out, that wave ran for approximately 53 years. In 1925, when he published his book, The Major Economic Cycles, using existing data, Kondratiev overlaid the wave on world history and projected it forward, meaning that, as far as the Kondratiev wave goes at least, everything for the last 89 years has been conjecture on his part, not conjuncture, conjecture. How did he do? Well, as it turns out, surprisingly well. Kondratiev nailed far too many major turns to have his work simply dismissed. And as it turned out, his most recent turn into winter came in 2000, or for those of you who measure the passing of time by such things, precisely at the moment the tech bubble burst. The blue shaded area here shows how far into the current Kondratiev downwave we are, and perhaps more importantly, how much farther we may have to go before things are supposed to turn around. But what are the inner workings of a Kondratiev winter look like? And are we actually in the middle of one, as a near 90-year-old forecast would have us believe? The, uh, the four seasons in a Kondratiev wave are broken down, like Schumpeter's cycles, uh, and characterized by the phenomena usually seen during each specific phase of the full cycle. I won't go into all four now as we don't have time, but we'll concentrate on the longest phase, winter, as it's the one we currently supposedly find ourselves mired in. Now, in a Kondratiev winter, the first major phenomenon is a bout of deflation. So how are we doing on that score? Well, in the USA, after a short bout uh, during 2008-2009, the Fed has managed to turn the ship around rather nicely. The Eurozone, well, uh, as we know, and today is confirmed, they're in the middle of a pitched battle against the forces of deflation, and not to put too fine a point on it, they're getting their asses kicked. The UK, a country utterly addicted to debt, is in fine health, assuming, of course, you measure a country's health by its strong inflationary forces and its massive debt load. And unfortunately, an ever-increasing number of people do these days. And then, of course, there's our old friends, Japan, the country these kinds of discussions are absolutely impossible to have without mentioning. Japan suffered from a prolonged period of deflation, lasting the best part of 20 years, but Arbonomics has seemingly fixed those little problems for now, at least. So I think it's safe to say that <coughs> ooh, there is no outright deflation. So it's also equally fair to say that there's an ongoing struggle. So we'll hold off on making a definitive judgment on that little piece of the puzzle. Next up is the premise that equities will be in a bear market during a Kondratiev winter. And as these charts demonstrate, and uh, everybody in the room knows only too well, that is clearly a big fat fail. <coughs> which brings us to another sign uh, of a Kondratiev winter, which is the mass repudiation of debt. Now, during winter, one of the major causes of that onset, uh, of, of that particular season, debt is repudiated. People want nothing to do with it. As you can see from this chart, as the world went into the Kondratiev winter in 2000, far from repudiating debt, we'd been embracing it like never before. By the end of 2007, before things got nasty, the total global issuance of debt securities, as measured by the BIS, had doubled since 2000 to reach a staggering $69.2 trillion. From there, well, it's not exactly what you call repudiation. 
In fact, another $21.6 trillion has been added to the mountain of debt hanging over the world. Why the massive surge? Well, that would once again be down to our old friends at the Federal Reserve, and we'll come to that shortly. The truth is, we've all been beaten over the head with stories of the credit crunch by now, and tales of austerity, or how difficult it's been to access credit since 2008. But as always, the reality is somewhat different. Since December 2007, the total debt in the financial sector has increased a mere 0.5%. It's a start. It's not exactly repudiation. However, the non-financial sector has taken the baton up with some relish and run with it, increasing their total debt by 67% in just over six years. And then, of course, there's governments, a body of men and women to whom austerity means uh, spend more. Or... So they, they also, they've laid on another 67% uh, of debt burden while struggling manfully to balance their budgets. Is that? Oh, it's just my... Okay. Uh, so that's another uh, big fat fail. And our old friend, Comrade Kondratiev, is starting to look a little bit unhinged. However, now we get to the middle of the order, and this is where things pick up a little bit. Bankruptcies, well, they spiked in 2005 as people rushed to declare themselves bankrupt before a new set of rules came in that would make it harder to do so. The new rules slashed personal bankruptcy filings by 75% in 2006, but guess what? Up they went again straight afterwards, this time on a far steeper trajectory than that prior to the alterations to the rules. So... Finally, I'm taking that one. Banking crisis, you've got to give me that one. And obviously, I'm taking the credit crunch, uh, which brings us nicely to rising interest rates. Now, is there anybody in the room old enough to remember those? Anybody? No, I didn't think so. Of course, rates have been falling and then falling some more for decades now. And let's face it, as the major tool available uh, to help supposedly smooth out the uh, business cycle, you'd expect this chart to look somewhat more cyclical in nature. Many people assume that once rates got to zero, they couldn't go any lower. How could we be so foolish? Zero is only the lower bound in interest rates in the real world, but we now live in this central bank-created fantasy land, so the normal rules don't apply. Either way, sadly, I have, I have to stick another one in the fail column. Currency crises, well, there's been plenty of those since the turn of the century, including several bubbling away right now in places like Russia and Ukraine and Belarus. So I'm taking that one too, which just leaves a rising gold price. Now, it seems a long time ago for those of us who believe in the value of holding gold, that it rose year after year. But from the beginning of the Kondratiev winter, gold climbed relentlessly. And even though the setbacks of the past couple of years have put a dent in that, that's not enough to uh, steal this one from me. We can wrestle outside, but I'm taking it. So there you have it. It's close, and it's hardly conclusive, but by a narrow majority, it looks as though we are in a Kondratiev winter. However, the fact that the score is so close is actually a little bit misleading. So let's take a look at the missing ingredients and see if they have anything in common. Now, the misses... Deflation, equity bear markets, debt repudiation, and rising interest rates are all, of course, inextricably linked. They all flow directly from interest rate policy. Rising interest rates generally dictate that equities enter bear markets, deflation becomes a threat, or at the very least, inflation becomes less of one, and debt is discharged or defaulted upon. Of course, the policy of the Fed uh, has been one of lowering rates consistently and at the first sign of any trouble in the economy, trouble that used to be called a normal part of the business cycle. And those falling rates have had a predictable effect on equities, debt, and inflation. Falling interest rates. Every central banker's first, and until recently, last line of defense against the downward part of the business cycle. By lowering rates to zero, and thereby staving off those three important facets of the Kondratiev winter, the Fed and its cohort around the world have, optically at least, made things look as though they're not so bad. But even interest rates are beholden to the law of diminishing returns. And as the zero bound is reached, and the effect of another marginal cut in rates diminishes to virtually zero, new measures are called for. Those, those new measures have largely been in the form of quantitative easing these past few years. But even magic money, conjured out of thin air, has its limits in terms of effectiveness, which is why the Europeans are now experimenting with negative interest rates. The longer this goes on, the more desperate the measures become. And the question, of course, is why? And the answer has its roots in another peace treaty of sorts that again involved Keynes, this time the Bretton Woods Agreement, which was thrashed out at the, uh, at the Mount Washington Hotel in New Hampshire in, uh, to right after World War II. Now, that agreement, like that at Versailles in 1919, went against the recommendations of Keynes. It established the IMF and the World Bank and cemented the dollar's status as the reserve currency. It also ushered in an era of unprecedented economic peace. As a quarter of a century passed between the signing of the Bretton Woods Agreement and the oil shocks of the 1970s. That economic peace, however, would have far-reaching consequences. Now, if we take a look at the growth of both credit and GDP in the US after World War II ended, we see a remarkable story unfold. 
Now, clearly, credit growth has accelerated away from real growth, and the reasons for that acceleration are clear if we add in a few additional pieces of information. Firstly, we'll add our old favourite, the Fed funds rate. And as you can see here, from the end of World War II, both credit and GDP grew in lockstep. So what changed? Well, of course, the soundness of money changed. In recent weeks, the speculators have been waging an all-out war on the American dollar. Accordingly, I have directed the Secretary of the Treasury to take the action necessary to defend the dollar against the speculators. All-out war, huh, Dick? When Nixon closed the gold window on August the 15th, 1971, to protect it from these evil speculators we keep hearing about, he also ensured that credit creation would essentially become as easy as saying yes. Immediately after the dollar was saved from speculators, uh, the divergence, as you can see here, between growth and credit began to expand, even as interest rates soared due to the inflation unleashed by Nixon's actions. Finally, though, interest rates reached their peak and began their journey lower from a little over 18%, to where we find them today, and that meant the gloves were off and credit creation took off like a rocket. Fueled by those rapidly declining rates and a growing sense that the Fed would lower rates some more at the first sign of any trouble. The business cycle was so 1960s. Interestingly enough, if we highlight the period between 1954 and 1969, we see that credit and GDP both grew steadily despite interest rates increasing 11-fold. Now, a close-up look at this particular period is even more instructive when it comes to the unchecked business cycle. Now, as I pointed out, between October 1954 and October 1969, rates climbed 11-fold. But more tellingly, during that 15-year period, they fluctuated along with the business cycle, adjusting up and down as conditions warranted. During that single span, rates quadrupled, fell by five-sixths, rose nearly seven-fold, fell by three-quarters, quadrupled again, halved, then doubled in the space of a 15-year period. However, if we overlay the business cycle, represented by the PMI Composite Index, we see something that today would be considered extraordinary. A business cycle that ebbs and flows without ever really getting out of hand, despite the extreme moves contained within that snapshot. In fact, as you can see here, the PMI was in expansion, which is the blue shaded area, far more than it was contracting, despite a difference in interest rates from bottom to top of 8.5%. Anybody care to hazard a guess what would happen to the US economy if interest rates hit 9% today? It wouldn't be pretty. If we zoom out and look at the PMI over a longer period of time, it only hammers home the point. With the x-axis uh, left blank, spotting the chart pattern we just looked at in amongst the broader picture is basically impossible. It's here for anyone who is actually curious. Now, if we stick with this chart, it's easy to see the next consequence of this peaceful economic environment and easy credit, and that's an explosion in equity markets. With the S&P 500 following the trajectory of the expansion in credit until the mid-90s, when it became abundantly clear that the Fed's default response would be to slash rates in the face of any faltering of the business cycle. And then the party really got going. We had a reversion to the trend line when the tech bubble inevitably burst in, in 2000, followed by a return to trend growth, along with more rabid credit creation. And then came 2008 and the Fed's massive blitz of funny money, which was absolutely vital in order to stop everything falling apart and the lines of credit and growth converging again in a hurry. You can see the tiny little blip there that actually represents the global financial crisis. But not everyone has been fooled by the deluge unleashed by the Federal Reserve with the aim of keeping this economic peace intact. Volumes on equity markets around the world have plummeted despite a seemingly endless procession of new all-time highs being made by indices all around the world, as investors who were shaken up by 2000 got completely chased out by 2008. But the twin milestones of the closing of the gold window and peak rates are creating even more instability elsewhere. Next up, the US budget deficit. And once again, you can see the difference made by the abandoning of the gold standard compounded by the peaking of interest rates. The US monetary base has followed a similar path, uh, at least up until 2008, when after dropping rates to essentially zero and running headlong into that law of diminishing returns I spoke about earlier, the Fed were forced to expand it from $800 billion to its current four plus trillion, or face a shattering of this economic peace. All of which brings us to the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. The cost of maintaining this economic peace is staggering beyond anything we thought we understood just a few short years ago. Assets on the Federal Reserve balance sheet now stand at over $4 trillion, as opposed to the $925 billion they owned on September the 10th, 2008. But it's when we add the Fed's total capital to this chart that things get a bit more interesting. It looks okay, yes? Right up until the point where you look at the uh, y-axis on the right-hand side of the chart. In order to keep the peace, with interest rates already pegged at zero, 
the only option open to the Fed was to massively increase the wrong side of its balance sheet, which, of course, they did without hesitation. Now, if we take a dozen snapshots, each of them 12 months apart, and do a little measuring, we start to get a better sense of the ledge out onto which the Fed has so gleefully walked. If we add back in the Fed's total capital, this time on the same scale as its liabilities, we can see that their solvency is, how shall I put this delicately, questionable, let's use that. Or it would be if they couldn't create money out of thin air, of course. Now, back in 2007, the issue of leverage in the investment banking community, which hadn't mattered to anybody for many, many years, suddenly mattered to everybody, seemingly overnight. For the usual reason in such cases, people started to worry about losing money. Now, amazingly, having financial institutions levered 30 times became something to fear, seemingly overnight. And of course, while things like that can go on for a long time, once the fear takes hold, it's game over. Today, at the end of 2014, after the massive expansion of its balance sheet in the name of keeping this economic peace intact, the Fed's leverage is literally off the charts. If we want to get some real perspective on this, we have to do a little shrinking. Now, the price of peace has been very, very heavy indeed. And generally speaking, throughout history, when the price of peace becomes too extreme, the pendulum tends to swing back to the other extreme. Now, you may or may not have noticed it, but since uh, the turn of the century and the onset of this Kondratiev winter that we're talking about, the number of wars in which we've all been embroiled, one way or another, has taken a significant turn higher. Wow, that base is heavy. There are wars going on everywhere, and some of the enemies being found to rally people against are a little abstract, to say the least. Nonetheless, the drums are beating. However, there's one war that is uh, far more insidious than any of the overt conflicts you hear about from endless, boring men and women like me standing on podiums behind a microphone. It's the one war that isn't talked about, and it's the one war the public isn't making a fuss about, which is a shame, but it's the one war that affects just about everybody. It's the war on savers. Now, the last remaining pool of untapped capital in the is the world's savings, and that's firmly in the sights of central banks and governments everywhere. If you think about this war in, in its basic terms, it's actually quite scary. We've already seen the expansion of the last 40 years has been down to one long orgy of credit creation, and that orgy has required more and more punch to keep the party going. Over that time, however, the increase in real GDP generated by each additional dollar of debt has plummeted. Uh, it was $4.61 right after World War II, it's $0.08 cents in 2012. Uh, at this point, the charts were getting a bit depressing, so I've made this one flowery just to make a few people smile. <laughs> Now, all the while, every major central bank in the world has been trying its damnedest to create this magical 2% inflation, which will help lessen the impact of the soaring debt burden. And that's a debt burden enabled by two things. One, the dollar status is the world reserve currency, and two, the economic peace. Now, because allowing the imbalances created over the last 40 years to correct themselves would plunge the world into a depression, desperate measures are called for. And the Fed, as well as every other major central bank uh, everywhere around the world, has been forced into doing absolutely anything necessary to maintain this economic peace and keep the expansion of credit going, including abolishing the downward half of the business cycle to try and ensure that deflation and all the other deadly facets of the Kondratiev winter are avoided. Now, hands up those of you in the room who have either read the book or seen the movie of Sebastian Junger's book, The Perfect Storm. Anybody seen that? Not many of you. Okay. For those of you who haven't, it's, uh, it's an amazing true story about a group of swordboat fishermen on the Grand Banks uh, who get caught in the biggest storm of the century and face a life and death battle for survival. In the climactic scene, ruggedly handsome skipper George Clooney, who it has to be said looks nothing like anybody I've ever seen holding a fishing rod, uh, and ruggedly handsome fisherman uh, Mark Wahlberg, ditto, having uh, battled 100-foot waves for hours, finally catch a glimpse of the sunlight, and they think they've made it to the other side of the storm. Immediately, though, the sunlight disappears, and the skies darken, and they realise that they're back in the middle of the maelstrom once again. Worse still, they find themselves faced with one more giant wave 150 feet high. Clooney guns the boat's weary engines, and they try desperately to climb the near vertical face of this wave. But as they near the top, the forces of nature are simply too much for the boat, and it plunges down the face of the wave, is turned over, and vanishes forever. The Fed, the Bank of England, the Bank of Japan, the ECB, they're all on the face of that wave, gunning the engines for all they're worth, and running into diminishing returns everywhere they turn, as this suffocating debt load threatens to overwhelm them. 0% rates, QE1, QE2, QE3, Operation Twist, ABS purchases, the doubling of the Japanese monetary base, and now negative interest rates. They've tried everything, and this wave continues to rise up to meet them. At some point, maybe soon, the forces of nature that drive the business cycle will overwhelm their ultimately futile efforts. 
Meanwhile, in the background, the continuing stealth efforts to create this inflation with the aim of getting citizens to pay for government profligacy continues apace. Keynes was never more right than when he identified the pernicious effects of inflation. And today's disengaged society just makes the task that much easier. Kondratiev's research into cycles turned up another extraordinary phenomenon that further cemented the link between economics and war. It became apparent that those same 53-year economic cycles could be relied upon to mark major conflicts as well as major economic turning points. Now, as you can see, the bad news is that these long-wave cycles are uncannily accurate at predicting major conflicts. But the good news is we seem to be right in the middle of a cycle, which would suggest that we are as far away from a major conflict as we could be. But, of course, just as Kondratiev expanded upon Juglar and Schumpeter's uh, shorter cycles to find the larger wave, the process works in two directions. And so within that 53.3-year cycle is a shorter 17.7-year uh, cycle, and the news from that one isn't quite as good, I'm afraid. Now, war and economics have always been inextricably linked, and they will forever remain so. If you're not used to that idea, then you need to get used to it, and you need to get used to it quickly. The worse the economic situation gets, the higher the likelihood of a conflict. That's been the case since the dawn of money, and it's true today, regardless of the fact that most people firmly believe that a major war is now impossible. Now, remember this slide from what probably seems like about two hours to you guys. Uh, it showed the geopolitical state of the world right before the outbreak of World War I. Now, exactly a century on, the echoes of the past are too loud to simply ignore. For the UK, the world's policeman at the time, you can safely read the USA. Germany has morphed into China, and the French have been replaced by the Japanese as our fading giant. And we even have our own Uncle Maynard. Oops, there we go. Let's sort that out, just in case. Sorry. And not only is the big picture eerily reminiscent of 1914, but if we dig a little deeper into the detail, we find that though the names have changed, the mechanics that make up the world today are a little too close to comfort of those of 1914. Territorial claims, religious unrest, uh, heavily armed, unstable nations, proxy wars, terrorism, and above all, complacency. But it doesn't end there, I'm afraid. Fear in the West over the growing economic strength of China, China's own desire for a much bigger role on the world uh, stage, globalization, increased tourism, are all prevalent, as is the general assumption that war is unthinkable. And there's that word again. Now, Keynes' description of life right before the outbreak of World War I could have been written for today. Only instead of his daily newspaper, we'd have to substitute American Idol or Big Brother. Or my own favourite, The Great British Bake Off. Now, this is a top-rated show from the UK about which one of a dozen ordinary people can bake the best cake. Seriously. Now, don't laugh. An argument on that show between this man... Where is he? There he is. And this woman in the UK about a month or two ago, about to bake to Alaska, knocked both the Ukraine and ISIS off the front pages of the broadsheet newspapers for a week. I despair, honestly. Now, the Treaty of Versailles ushered in an era of peace after World War I, but that peace was short-lived because, from an economic standpoint, it heaped enormous pressure on Germany, pressure that was enough to drive the Germans back to war just 20 years after its signing. The Bretton Woods Agreement, a new financial system recognised as being so crucial it was hammered out while the world was still at war, demonstrated that the lessons of Versailles had been learned to a degree and that the importance of money in relation to warfare uh, was understood. Its signing began an era of economic peace that lasted a quarter of a century. But that too began to uh, fray in the early 70s as the dollar came under pressure from those evil speculators. And I should probably interject that by evil speculators, what Nixon meant was the de Gaulle administration of France who were swapping their dollars for gold as they were perfectly at liberty to uh, under the Bretton Woods Agreement. But I digress. Now, in order to keep that peace, America was forced to renege on the Bretton Woods Agreement. But by doing so, the money spigot just got open wide, and they embarked upon this era of credit creation, which just got more extreme the more it continued consequence-free. The bursting of the tech bubble was the first real sign that something was wrong, but the response from the Fed was both instant and desperate, and designed solely to prevent the wheels coming off, a decision that would merely set the world on course for a bigger disaster. Many people thought that in 2008 we faced our day of reckoning and we survived. But the truth is, 2008 was just another tremor, albeit a major one, warning of a future massive impending quake. The real day of reckoning, when this unconscionable level of debt that's been built up during the fiat money era finally topples over under its own weight, like the, weight in the, perf uh, the wave in the perfect storm, lays ahead of us. Both war and financial collapse occur in cycles and are subject to the overwhelming laws of nature. Now, these inherent uh, characteristics of the natural order are permanent. They cannot be altered. 
what the Fed and the rest of the central banks have done in trying to rewrite these natural, orders, uh, natural laws of human behaviour um, and finance is likely to lead to either a war or a collapse in the financial system, or both. At this point in time, the exact outcome is undecided, but the options have narrowed considerably. Now, over the past six years, those at the helm have pulled every lever and pushed every button available to them in a desperate attempt to stave off this inevitable and natural cleansing of the business cycle, because all those years of economic peace have resulted in an unprecedented credit inflation. And as my good friend Dylan Grice uh, recently said, if you've had an unprecedented credit inflation, then you will have an unprecedented credit deflation. Now, all that the economic peace the central banks of the world have desperately tried to maintain these past several decades has ended up doing is making that credit inflation larger and therefore infinitely more dangerous than anything that's gone before it. The consequences will be dire. Now, as I was driving uh, in Sydney a few weeks ago, I found myself sat behind a small SUV which had this decal on, the, on its spare tyre cover. Now, the quote from the book Fight Club, as a movie which was ironically released uh, at the end of 1999 at the height of the Nasdaq bubble, sums up the world of today quite nicely, I thought. But I sat staring at this, uh, at this tyre cover as we crawled our way through Sydney traffic, and each traffic light, I, I, I got up close with this thing again. And I realised that this whole thing can be actually boiled down to something even simpler than Chuck Palahniuk's pity prose. We buy things with money we don't have. Now, how does that possibly end well? You've been very patient, and I thank you very much for your time. <laughs>Thank you, Grant, for that uh, tour of the world and the great um, economists. Uh, I only have uh, actually one, one question. Shoot. And that's how uh, you, you're also an advisor for the Wolps uh, Investment mm -hmm. Fund. So adding all of this, where should people put their money in Well, we, we've, um, we've watched these markets, uh, bond markets, equity markets. So when we talk about markets, we're talking listed markets, just become more and more, we think, stretched over the last couple of years. And we've gradually been exiting markets and moving our money into assets. Into, we've, we've bought farmland, we've bought real estate, and we still think there are pockets of value that, uh, in those around the world. We've got a healthy allocation to cash because we think um, just from an asymmetric risk basis. And I work for a guy who, uh, who ran a volatility fund through the crisis. He was uh, long volatility and short credit and made an awful lot of money. So his, his, uh, his investment thesis is really governed by those asymmetric risk payoffs. And we just think that, that you know, there's a very negative asymmetric risk profile to being in equity markets at these levels, and particularly uh, government bonds. Um, you know, we wouldn't touch those with a barge pole. So yeah, uh, cash um, and, and real assets, which we think are going to continue to get inflated uh, as, as what I've just talked about, continues to, to go forward. That's a sound and good advice. Thank you very much for coming. Great pleasure. Big round of Thank applause you. for Grant Williams. Thank you very much.